Welcome to Digital Detectives, reports from the battlefront. We'll discuss computer forensics, electronic discovery, and information security issues and what's really happening in the trenches. Not theory, but practical information that you can use in your law practice, right here on the Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the 76th edition of Digital Detectives. We're glad to have you with us. I'm Sharon Nelson, president of Sensei Enterprises. And I'm John Simic, vice president of Sensei Enterprises. Today on Digital Detectives, our topic is smishing, a growing cybersecurity threat. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We would like to thank our sponsor, SiteLock, the global leader in website security solutions. Learn more at sitelock.com forward slash legal forward slash digital detectives. We would also like to thank our sponsor, PINow.com. Need a private investigator you can trust? Visit PINow.com to learn more. We are delighted to welcome as today's guest, Joe Hamlin, Director of IT Operations for Sprint's Emerging Platforms. Joe has more than 25 years of IT experience, and in his current position, he is responsible for end-user platform engineering, including collaboration, identity access management, and device engineering management. Thanks for joining us today, Joe. Well, thanks, John and Sharon. I really appreciate it. It looks like a great topic, and I'm glad uh, you've invited me to participate. Well, let's get started by some of the confusion I think our listeners will have, because most of them will not be familiar with the term smishing. Can you explain what it means in, in easy-to-understand language? Well, we'll give you the official definition first that you would go, and if you ever Googled it, this is what you'd find out on the Internet. And it's simply put, smishing is the act of using a mobile phone text messaging service to lure victims into immediate actions such as downloading mobile malware, visiting malicious websites, or calling a fraudulent phone number. All right, so basically what they're doing is they're preying upon us as victims in many cases to use something that we trust, giving our, our, our attachment to our mobile devices to elicit uh, an immediate response out of us. So they're trying to get us to give our personal information, some type of identity or account information. And that's really what it comes down to. It's that simple. So besides these unwanted phone calls that we're getting all the time, Joe, and I've noticed myself personally too, that there's been an increase in these text messages from folks that I have no clue who the heck they are. But can you tell our, our listeners, why is smishing growing so rapidly? Well, John, I think that's a great question. And, you know, where I sit, you know, as an IT owner and operator, what I think has happened in our space is we have put so much reinforcement into the enterprise space specifically. Uh, We've done a lot of education in around phishing. We've got tools in place to protect our email uh, from phishing, such as, you know, advanced threat protection, next generation firewalls. We're doing a lot of web filtering. So when we do get tricked, we're able to catch a lot of the websites that users might click on to go to. So we've put a lot of things to protect the enterprise. So now we've allowed, we've kind of put ourselves in a position to where the bad guys, the predators, you know, they're going out and they're finding other solutions because the ones that they've used in the past have now been kind of bulletproofed, if you will. Now, don't don't get me wrong. We still um, fight phishing every day, and we still have folks trying to attack us every day. And we see those through our tools and our and our advanced threat protection reporting software that we have. We see those things going on. But our users are more educated now when they see these emails that they're not as apt to click on that. Now, the same thing that's happening there has not yet moved over into the mobile space. People are a little too comfortable, I would say, with their mobile devices. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, which is, I was thinking about why smishing works so well for cyber criminals. Is it just that we're more careless with text messages on our phones? Is that really the explanation? I think that's exactly spot on, Sharon. You know, when our uh, these cyber criminals, this is very easy to set up for them, too. So when you think about it, what's it take to put on a, a cyber campaign for smishing? Well, you need VOIP server, you know, a burner cell phones, a method to spoof your phone number, and then you just need a good story, all right? What's going to compel you? So people respond and they react to two things, greed and fear, typically. So either I'm going to text you, and you automatically 
have this comfort level because you use this device so much. You have this comfort level that you automatically assume that anyone contacted me, I know. They got my information because I gave it to them. So we have this comfort level with this device that we automatically become a little bit more susceptible to these text messages coming in that uh, I think it really does set us up for a little bit more vulnerability in that space. So, Joe, how can these smishing attacks, how, how can they af- affect a business? And is that going to be any different than an impact on a consumer? Well, you know, I think first and foremost, the consumer's probably at the most risk. But there's no doubt that there are attacks going on every day to try to solicit information from the enterprise user. So my customers, I'm, uh, you know, I manage a large IT environment. Uh, I got a lot of end users that I support, nearly uh, 70,000, both contractor and employees. And they're always being attacked in some fashion. We know that. We're trying to solicit some type of response. And this is just one other method that they've moved to. And, you know, it's, it's really about how can they compromise our systems? How can they gain information about our users, our employees that might allow them to somehow gain some financial benefit? And that's really what most of these things come down to. Now, one of the things that I am concerned about from a business perspective is the ability to put a smishing campaign on that it targets my employees to potentially give up their user credentials for whatever reason. And then that opens another threat for me, which could be some type of cyber attack. Because, you know, if you have uh, my ADID and credentials, along with my password for whatever reason, now you can really attack my enterprise and potentially cause some some major harm to the IT environment. And what we worry about is if my user was susceptible to being spoofed into believing that I would for some reason, and I would never do this, nor would any IT group that I, that I can think of, would reach out to one of my users over SMS messages and ask for their user credentials. Wouldn't happen, but that is one of the fears that we have. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, it is amazing how often they fall for that. I agree. <laughs> oh, absolutely, and, and these guys are good. They they come up with great stories, and they're able to to mimic, and they're able to create web pages that look official, and they're very good at what they do. So, is it fair, Joe, that the attacks on the businesses then that they're essentially they're targeted attacks then, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can come up with a number of different ways, right? So let's say one of the things you can start thinking about is LinkedIn, to me, is a big concern. When my employees, when the folks who work for me, they got a lot of capabilities and a lot of power in inside the IT environment so they can access all the systems. When they post their information out onto LinkedIn or Facebook, the bad guys are able to see what they do you know, what their jobs are. So if I see a guy that's an active directory engineer at at Sprint, I get concerned if he has that information inside of his LinkedIn profile because he automatically becomes a target for the bad guy. They want to find out his credentials. They want to get his information because armed with that, they can do a lot of damage. Mm. You know, what I don't understand, and I think a lot of folks don't, is why can't the security application you have on your smartphone Why can't that protect you against smishing? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge you run into there is most of the environments you're dealing with today are all bring your own device. There are a few industries that focus on providing company liable devices, but we're trying to take advantage of consumerization of IT. You guys are very familiar with that term, Mm -hmm. but it really means, hey, people can bring their personal devices into the workspace and leverage them. So, When you think about SMS, it's pretty much the simplest form of communication and the simplest form of use case that uh, is used on the cell phone itself. You know, when you, you look at some of the research, they say on average the adult user will send over 2,000 messages and receive over 1,800 messages every month. So we're very comfortable with it. It's a very, very simple form. There's, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's not really easy to put security around, particularly in a BYOD type of environment. Now, there are some things inside of Apple's iOS. You can go out there and block text messages from certain numbers. But the challenge you're fighting here is You know, when you're looking at these predators, the perpetrators out there, they're able to, by simply spoofing their number, they just change it one digit and they'll attack you again the next day or the next week. So it's hard to stay ahead of them using these mobile devices. Well, Joe, as a business owner, 
what's the best way to protect my business against these smishing attacks, let's say, on my employees? Yeah, I would say, John, you know, the thing that I have kind of discovered just doing my own research is there's not a lot of enterprise owners who are thinking about smishing. I mean, yeah, we're all familiar with fishing. We're all familiar with, you know, Trojans and malware, but there's not a lot of folks who are really thinking about the vulnerabilities that can come from smishing. But I think this always starts with education. You have to educate your folks that, you know what, if it doesn't look right, if somebody's contacting you via your, your SMS text messaging and asking for personal information and claiming it's your bank or claiming it's part of the company or a vendor, that's not typically the type of message you're going to get, and it's probably one you want to steer away from. So I think education is the first key. There are some solutions out there that can help do simulated attacks to help you baseline, and you know we can talk about those uh, as we get further into the conversation if you like. Well, before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick commercial break. At least 80 of the 100 biggest law firms in the country have been hacked since 2011. Protect your firm and your clients from cyber attacks with SiteLock. Their industry-leading cloud-based suite of website security solutions includes website scanning, web application firewall, including distributed denial of service mitigation, and 24-7, 365 U.S.-based customer support. Give your firm and your clients peace of mind knowing their information is secure. Learn more at sitelock.com forward slash legal forward slash digital detectives. Does your law firm need an investigator for a background check, civil investigation, or other type of investigation? PINow.com is a -a one-of-a-kind resource for locating investigators anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide. The professionals listed on PI Now understand the legal constraints of an investigation, are up-to-date on the latest technology, and have extensive experience in many types of investigation, including workers' compensation and surveillance. Find a pre-screened private investigator today. Visit www.pinow.com. Welcome back to Digital Detectives on the Legal Talk Network. Today, our topic is smishing, a growing cybersecurity threat. Our guest is Joe Hamlin, Director of IT Operations for Sprint's Emerging Platforms. Joe, what are the red flags that the text you're looking at is a smishing attack? I think there's several things when you look at it is when it comes in and I don't recognize the number or if it doesn't look like a valid number or if it's asking me for, you know, some type of information that just doesn't feel right, trust your instincts and really start to question where that information is coming from. And maybe make a phone call, check, make sure web links and those types of things, if, especially if there's web links in there, make sure that they match. You know, if it's coming from your bank, make sure it matches your bank because that's not typically how they're going to reach out to you. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's true. I, I just got one, uh, oh, geez, Sharon, when was it? A couple months ago where it said it was a friend of mine who I've never heard their name before. <laughs> and then they had a link in it and said, here's photos from our, you know, our get together, but they're going to expire in 24 hours. So you better hurry up and click on it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They're, they're trying to get a response for you, and they're trying to get you to, to re- respond, and it's going to usually take you somewhere, and then it's going to ask you to log in, and it's going to probably ask for some type of you know personal information, and then from there they start building a method of uh, how to attack you, so... Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I have to thank the person because I use that screenshot and, and when we do presentations about this stuff. <laughs> well, I think I read somewhere that the reasons that people click so often and I don't remember the order, but it's fear, curiosity, and urgency. Like what you said, John, that a link is going to expire very quickly. That really apparently works a lot. Yeah, you'll typically see things, and I even worry about it, you know, as we move into uh, the, you know, tax season, a lot of folks trying to do phishing and smishing campaigns, claiming to be the IRS, and I, to be honest with you guys, I don't know that I've ever had the IRS reach out to me over text <laughs> asking for my personal information. If they're asking, hey, you guys know more about me than, than anybody, you already have my personal information, so why are you asking me for it? Well, they're, 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 they'll probably be a little more clever, you know, click here to begin your audit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
<laughs> well, Joe, should you report these attacks to authorities? And if so, how do you go about doing that? Yes, yeah, so there's several ways to do it. So obviously, you know, if you're just being spammed, then you're pretty comfortable with spam. You can forward those complaints to, just text them to 7726, and your carrier, just about every carrier I know of, has some type of spam team in place that will pick that up. Obviously, you, you know, you guys are, are dealing with the, the legal side of this, and you're more familiar with it than I am, but you can also report these to your local uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, now, in many cases, depending upon where they're at and what their comfort level is, they're probably going to say, well, is there an intent to commit a crime or was there a crime committed is going to determine how much they're going to and how much they're going to work on it, how much effort they're going to put into it, and do they have the resources to deal with cyber crime. So that's probably the next pace. And, you know, you always start with your, your local authorities. And then finally, you can go out to the FCC consumer complaints and you can go to their website and you can put in a uh, formal and informal complaint to the FCC for these types of devices. Those are the three methods that, that we take advantage of and that we know about. I have kind of a follow-up question to something we talked about before, and that is you were talking about BYOD, but of course there are a lot of law firms that have mobile device management how can that help protect against the smishing attacks? Yeah, that's a good question. As I was doing my research, I, I use a one of the largest providers of MDM, and they primarily protect my uh, retail environment, so where we have our point-of-sale solutions over our devices. And that was one of the questions And as I was digging in there is, how can I leverage MDM to help me? And the biggest challenge you have, particularly in my case, and I think a lot of my peers are in the same situation, is not – all of our devices. We don't manage all of our devices. Again, I have uh, folks who bring in their own iPhones and iPads, and they want to sign up for mobile device management until they find out, hey, I'm going to have these types of controls in place. And then it's like, well, no, I really don't want to do that. So we don't <laughs> force them to, to join the MDM environment. But you know, there's a few things you can do. Let's say you are managing that device. Well, I can go out and I can be very, very hard-lined and I can actually stop SMS texting as one of the apps. So that's one of the things that I can do. Very, you know, uh, kind of a, a dictatorship type of uh, an environment and you're probably not going to have a lot of success doing that. So you'd want to do that with company-liable devices. So that's one of the things. You can put a lot of parameters around it. The other thing you can do you know, to help reduce that attack surface is, you know, you can look at the apps that are already on the devices. If you're using many of the mobile device solutions have its own mobile access gateway. So you can set those devices up where they have to come back in through the enterprise and you can then use your other filtering tools, whether it's a uh, blue coat uh, web filtering, those types of things to prevent your internal users from going back out to these fraudulent sites. But overall, you know, if you sit down to your MDM manufacturers and you talk to them, you're kind of limited. The MDM tool itself really doesn't bring you a whole lot of benefit unless you really start locking the devices down. So that's one of the things that uh, probably even, you know, the bad guys were trying to keep from attacking us, you know, they're well aware of these things. These guys are not dumb. They've got a lot of time on their hands and they've done their research and they know what type of protections are in place. And, you know, I think as we talked earlier, a lot of it simply comes back to educate your folks, hey, this is the latest threat. Um, it's the next threat. And it's things you got to be thinking about and putting the protections in place to help you stay ahead of the curve. So Joe, can an employer kind of test their employees out and kind of and do these pretend smishing attacks or campaigns and see how many folks click or fall for the things? I think I know the answer there is that, yeah, you probably can do that, but how would they go about doing such an event? Yeah, yeah, absolutely you can, John. I mean, we've been doing it for years with phishing, um, and there's a lot of tools out there to help you do phishing campaigns from an email perspective. Now you take that same type of solution, and, and at the risk of making this a product endorsement and throwing a name out there, you know, there is Smish Guru from Wombat Security Technologies. Works the same way as the phishing tools. What it's really intended to do is you load up your database with uh, your user's information. Basically, all you really need is uh, their phone numbers. And you're going to put in 
a web page that you're going to have them kind of to test them, right, as part of your baseline testing. You're going to text them. You're going to put some type of campaign together that says, hey, this is, you know, make up your story, if you will, but this is, a, you know, an IT or this is a financial. And just to see if you can get your users community to click on that web page and you're going to collect counts on how many of them come back there. And from that, now you can start putting an education plan. But yeah, so there are tools out there to do it, but it all is going to lead back to educating your users to be diligent, not to be so trusting, not to be so eager to jump in and give information out. Uh, at the end of the day, taking no action is your best safeguard to preventing phishing and smishing. But these are tools that you can use to help educate your user team. I, again, I think this is a, an area that's going to be growing as more and more people, unfortunately, probably get taken advantage of and smishing becomes more prevalent out there and people are aware of it, I think you're going to have to see the education curve catch up. Well, that's one reason why we were really happy to have you on the show today, uh, Joe, because when we ask people about smishing, I see, I feel like I've been drinking every time I say that word. When we ask them about our topic of the day, which is smishing, if we find that they often don't know what that is, um, if we ask for a show of hands, we hardly ever see one. So it just hasn't got what fishing has. Everybody seems to know fishing now, but not smishing. I have to say it carefully. Um, so, this, so you're really kind of on the leading edge here for a lot of, particularly the lawyers who tend to be listening to us. They just don't know about the subject. And so this has been a concise and very useful and practical drill for them. And I thank you very much for taking time out of your day to be our guest. Well, Sharon, John, thank you. I really appreciate it. I think it's a great conversation, and I hope your listeners really appreciate the information. Well, that does it for this edition of Digital Detectives. And remember, you can subscribe to all the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or on iTunes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please review us on iTunes. And you can find out more about Sensei's digital forensics, technology, and security services at SEN, SEI, ENT.com. We'll see you next time on Digital Detectives. Thanks for listening to Digital Detectives on the Legal Talk Network. Check out some of our other podcasts on LegalTalkNetwork.com and in iTunes.